Welcome to Integrative Lawyers of the World, where we believe lawyers can and do contribute to the healing of the world. We believe this because we know lawyers who are doing just this. Hi, I'm your host, Carrie Raleigh, and our guest this episode is Professor Camilla Anderson. Camilla is joining us from Australia. She is a lawyer and an academic. She's been an academic for 30 years on four different continents. She has a lot of experience in international commercial law, and she has devoted the last decade of her life to change and innovation and relational contract theory. She is changing the face of contract law, and she is humanizing law for everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. I hope you enjoy our conversation. And for more episodes and more conversations with lawyers from all over the world who are contributing to the healing of the world, go to our website at www.integrativelaw.com. Hi, Camilla. Thank you so much for joining us today on Integrative Lawyers of the World. And you're joining us all the way from Australia. How are you today? I'm fine. Thank you very much, Carrie, and thank you for inviting me on your show. It's a privilege to be here. You have the, the commercial experience, the business experience, but what I you are part of really humanizing law for everyone. And I'd like to talk about what does that mean? You know, some people say lawyers as designers, lawyers who are innovating the legal practice and humanizing it. What does that mean exactly? Well, I mean, there's a humorous way to answer your question. Uh, I'm on a quest to make sure that there are fewer lawyer jokes in the world. Um, and that lawyers are maybe perceived as nicer than rats and sharks. And we don't um, end up at the bottom of the sea a lot. That too. Not a good start. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we all know a ton of, of lawyer jokes. And I think there's a, there's, a, there's a problem with our profession. And we are beginning to see mental health issues in our profession, a lot of problems with the lack of human, sort of human behaviors in law. And it doesn't have to be that way, especially now that legal tech is taking over a lot of the very sort of technical and boring drudge work of, of legal due diligence and document checking. We can actually focus more on making the services that we provide much more for real humans and less technical and robotic. Let the legal tech do that. Um, and part of my humanizing law platform is to try and make sure that everything we do, we do for our end users to make it functional, to make it pleasant. And dare I say it, even enjoyable. Because yes, there is a planet on which you can enjoy contracts. And one way in which we're doing this is we are redesigning as part of the much larger Lawyers as Designers project that you can see at lawyersasdesigners.com. We are redesigning the way that visuals can complement contracts. Um, and even um, in some, we're beginning to see legal regulations. Why shouldn't we use images and even comic books to try and make relational contracts or more plain language texts in law better to understand, more engaging, more comprehensible, and to give law a more human feel. There's absolutely no reason why we shouldn't do that. I mean, one of my, my pet peeves about my profession, which to be honest, I love, is the fact that we aren't really taught properly how to talk to our end users. And as rude as that sounds, just think about it for a second. If, if you have a a whole team of medical professionals who are helping you in hospital and they come into your hospital room and they start talking and they only really know the jargon that they talk amongst themselves and they're trying to get you to explain how they're going to help you using only their own words you're not going to be too impressed which is of course why doctors nurses and all medical professionals have to take rigorous um, communications and bedside manner courses and how to communicate with end users but it's not just them, it's the engineers, the chemists, all the science communication. It's a thing that everybody in every profession has to do. Even engineers have to learn how to communicate with end users so that they can simplify the complex language of their profession. And lawyers are not good at that. I mean, we create contracts that are like phone books that are basically drafted with the 0.01% of weird things that could go wrong. And Sometimes we don't even bother to read them ourselves before we present them to our client because we don't expect them to either. And I think that's where we failed in contract law. So I'm on a mission to change that, not just with plain language, but by putting images in. We've created a lot of comic book contracts, and I would encourage anyone who's interested to head over to comicbookcontracts.com, where we have a number of examples of some weird and wonderful comic book contracts that are visual, legal, binding documents, and span all kinds of industries from mental health to 
children to bank product schedules, to terms and conditions um, for lots of different services and handymen, you name it, we've got it. We have covered over the last nine years now, a ton of different contracts with visuals. And it's just a small part of that humanizing law but it's working. I think a lot of people will be interested in the visual contracts and the comic contracts. And I know you um, are part of a comic books contract project with the University of Australia. So I do, and actually I think we'll probably end up spending most of our conversation on that and some exams, because I just think it's so fascinating and so clear and interesting when looking at the actual contracts. But before we get to that, I just wanted to follow up a little bit on something that you said about how lawyers don't get any communication training. What type of training or how do you, how and when in your ideal world, what would you do to help lawyers be better communicators? Would you like want to have programs as part of the law school curriculum? Yeah, I look, I'm a, I'm a legal educator, so this must be a trick question. Um, I, I would really like to see lawyers um, teach law students how to better communicate complex legal ideas to end users. I would like all law students to have to go through a unit where all the complex legal aspects that they've been taught throughout their education is being turned into a plain language format. Um, the difficulty here is that you can't, there isn't a one size fits all in how to communicate a legal concept in a given context because it will be very context specific. So it will be down to industry, end users, the demographics and educational levels of whoever you're addressing it to, how you communicate. But making law students aware of that skill set of being able to communicate it in a way that appeals to those who are having to read this communication would certainly change a lot of things in law. Um, and I'm not saying that litigation needs to change because here we have highly educated lawyers talking to highly educated lawyers about complex problems. What I'm saying is the communication that is addressed at end users, notably contracts and some forms of regulations and terms and conditions, that has to change because it's written in what everyone laughingly calls unreadable legal gobbledygook. And you know what? I'm not wrong. It's not unreadable to us. We think it's fabulous. It's wonderful except when it isn't we all have seen our fair share of bad drafting, I'm sure. <laughs> but even when it's wonderful drafting, if it's all legalese, who's it really for? And that's a really key question. I mean, there was a, a case that settled in the UK about two years ago. Unfortunately, I can't cite it. I only know about it because I worked with, um, with the, the man who was consulting in the case. And it's a very high profile case that suddenly disappeared because two CEOs that had negotiated a very expensive and lengthy contract in a multi-million dollar potential dispute, both admitted openly to the judge that they hadn't read the contract. They had had their outhouse lawyers, or not in-house, but outhouse, negotiate it. And then they'd signed it without reading it. And the judge said, well, that signature does not represent a meaning of mine. So that contract is worthless. And he threw it in the bin. Had otherwise applicable law applied to the dispute, and then it was settled and went away. So that is thought provoking. And I know that's a very novel approach and a lot of lawyers will be going <gasps> right now. They can't, that's not right. That's not how law should be done. If they signed it, it's valid and it's binding, but is it? But if there's not a meeting of minds, right? That's first first or second week of contracts class. They openly admit that they never read it, that even if they tried to, they wouldn't have understood it. And there you go. There's that contract out of the window. Here in Australia, in three days, we have a new Unfair Contract Terms Act coming in. And I promise you, we are not ready for it. Because not only does it expand the concept of a small and medium enterprise to someone who's up to 10 million a year in turnover, so quite a large enterprise, if you ask me from my little perspective, but it, it imposes consumer-like regulations on contracting between these small and medium enterprises and anyone else who contracts with them, which means that they are protected from anything transparent, anything surprising, not just could this potentially then not be legal, legally binding, but it could be imposed a fine. So we'll see what happens, but there's more and more of this protectionism creeping in, even to commercial activity. I liked the idea behind that and the purpose of it. The cynical approach to me is thinking there's going to be a lot of litigation over what's transparent or not transparent. There is, but they're already, I mean, it doesn't, it, does, it doesn't change the standard of the requirements of transparency and what's surprising. 
it changes the consequences and uh, and those who are protected by the standards. So we'll see what happens. It's certainly very interesting. But my point is transparency and clarity in contracting is in everyone's interest, not just because we want to avoid disputes and we want to manage expectations fairly and equally. We want to focus on, and here's the key word, the relationship of the contract. And, and those who are listening will re realize that I'm a big fan of relational contracting and seeing the contractual relationship as something that could be pure, simple, and healthy. Um, so it's not just because of that, but it's also because now it's actually bad practice to not be transparent. Yeah. yeah. And here, just when you say the word transparent, and I think a lot of people, like, when you first think of transparent, like everything's being disclosed, I'm being open with you, I'm not hiding anything, right? I'm being transparent and letting you know. To have that has to also be understandable. Because if you're disclosing everything, but you're using language that is confusing, are you really disclosing it? You know, if it's not understood by the end user, even if it's 100% giving everything that, you know, giving all the information, all the facts, but it's not understood, is that transparent? I don't think so. Um, and Maybe that's a good cue to, to look at a, a product schedule from a bank. So if you don't mind, I'd love to share a screen and just take you through this. This is your comic books contract project website. And you have different examples of how you use visual contracts with different uh, in different situations from what we would call, you know, the the banks to individuals. And then you also have a project that you worked with, the Mission Australia project, which we'll talk about that too. Um, yeah, go ahead and share your screen and walk us walk us through maybe the bank's terms and conditions. But this is actually not um, my website. I'll show you my website in, in a moment. Uh, but what I'm showing you here is the actual product schedule from Bank West, which is the PDS that's available on their website, which you can see there. So this is live showing you a product schedule of the bank's bank account. There is no other product schedule. So the previous collection of product schedules in terms of conditions for the use of their bank accounts is all collected into this very simple comic. Now I say it's simple, but a bit, a bit like Mark Twain, you have no idea how complex this simplicity really was to, to create. So just look at, look at how simple it is. Now here's my fine print whisper. I'm gonna make sense of all the bank stuff for you. Okay, great. What is it for me? And there's a little conversation between Brandon, their typical customer, and the, and the female bank advisor. Um, so is, is this where all my banking info is? Yep. And there are some other documents as well. Have a look at these. And then this blackboard summarizes approximately three pages of clauses around requirements for opening an account with simple visuals around what's needed. You know, real person, age 11 or older. Uh, you can't have more than 10 accounts, no minimum opening deposit, joint accounts, and no credit interest. All of that. And then there's even room for a stupid joke about being a real person. Haha, -ha, I hope so. <laughs> then all the different ways to access your money, which was a separate document, now all compressed into a panel in this comic. The fees and charges, the F word, as they very humorously call it in this product schedule what they are and other fees that you might find in the guide to gang banking fees, but that tend to not be relevant for this contract. And then um, the halo ring and all the different aspects. How does that work? And there are some on the way out terms about the mortgage offsets. And then there's the financial claim scheme. You know, instead of having a dispute resolution clause, no, if things go wrong, then, you know, we're just interrupting this message. You know how we cunningly sit it outside the conversation by having it externally addressed. Uh, so how to lodge a complaint under the financial services scheme. Um, and then here's the number you can call. If you've got any more questions. Bam, that is a product schedule. Now, the fact that it's a bank is, of course, super interesting because most people will know that in the 70s, uh, banks had deliberate policies of putting fine print into contracts to try and hide terms from its uh, consumers. But a few years ago here in Australia, the Royal Commission very publicly spanked all the banks for being not transparent and for not being very clear about all their terms and conditions. And so we were very fortunate on the project that we were able to sort of handpick um, the bank that we wanted to work with, because a lot of them wanted to work with us and create this beautiful document as an easy transaction account product schedule, which has gone through the Australian Securities Exchange Commission ASIC and is an approved financial document. 
So for the sight impaired, you'll get a description of what's happening in the images and the um, and the exchange, so the, the narrative of the voices. I'm glad you mentioned that. I was going to ask you, how do you handle visual contracts like this for sight impaired? And it'll be like an audio describing it? Yeah, so that's, that's different. So different contracts will be dealt with in different ways. Uh, some of them might have a braille description of the images and, and what's going on. Some of them might have an audio version. Uh, some of them have much more integrated imagery like here. And so the narrative and the exchange is sort of, I think, important. And some of them will have very simple images that don't necessarily need to be described as part of the contract. Uh, so, yeah, it's, it's very different from contract to contract. We've worked on dozens of these projects now over the last eight uh, years. We have a lot of really interesting, very different contracts to share. The, the, the style, the visual, the colors, the profiling, the, the dialogue, the approach. I mean, this is what we call a conversation with the removal of fourth wall. The removal of fourth wall being the occasional sort of looking straight to camera and explaining things to you um, as the reader. Um, so it's a combination of, of those two, but we have lots of different approaches. The idea is to make it engaging, to make you want to read it. And it seems to be working. I mean, I, I used to say when we were working on this that throughout the life of this project, we hadn't had any disputes. So we still weren't sure how the courts would address these comic book contracts. But now that we were rolling out with banks, we were sure to get some disputes because they had so many disputes a year. Um, but this has been out now for two years nearly, and we still don't have any disputes. Not only that, uh, but they can, they've can they reported to us that they have had to relocate a large division of their um, customer complaints department. Because when you manage expectations very clearly, you don't get as many complaints. <laughs> Because people understand their accounts. They take the time to read it. They understand it. They can they can remember it because the combination of images and colors and words actually help the mnemonic technique. Um, and it's simple and it's not in legalese. So this is just one way of trying to humanize law by making a product schedule and the terms and conditions of a bank account much more accessible. So do you have lawyers and artists working together to create it? How... how... So if I'm a lawyer working at a law firm, I'm like, wow, that's great. I would love to do this. How would you suggest going about getting started? So there's lots of different ways in which the project has worked with law firms. And there isn't just one formula. So sometimes we get a contract uh, with a law firm who's saying, we have a client who wants this. Will you consult with us? And we say, yeah, we're happy to help consult. We have certain things that we do, but no project has ever been the same. So we would we'll do things like help them with the, the silhouetting, the value system and communicating very clearly and, and precisely what their contractual relationship is about. We will consult with them on the actual pain points of the contracts um, and we will side, try to make it very simple that way. But we can also create it for them. Um, my husband runs alternativecontracting.biz. You're well, very welcome to head over there and have a look at his contracts. But he has a commercial solutions um, to the contracts that we've already tried and tested through research. Uh, he's, he's quite happy to use people from my team. And then they moonlight uh, <laughs> for, a, for a faster and quicker solution with less research and, and less empirical focus group testing and, and what we call psychometric testing, where we prove the positive impact of the contract. So you're doing research on the positive impact of these visual contracts. Can you explain a little or tell me more about that research? I'm a researcher. So when I have a sponsored project like the Bank West one, the money doesn't go to me. It goes to the university and I hire a large team of people who work with uh, the pain points of the contracts. And because this was seven different uh, legal documents that we put into one, uh, we co-create with the sponsors of the research project. That's very important to us. These are co-created pragmatic solutions that have to work for the demographic end users. And we work very hard to ensure that there is a constant um, focus group testing, surveying of a wide demographic of end users, that they understand what we're doing, that the images are appropriate for the interpretation of the issues, and that it, it fits the bill. There's two reasons why we do that. We do that not just because we want to make sure we're creating a product that works, but also by proving that we have a product that works. The legal theory behind this is that we are proving the reasonable person interpretation of the visual contract so that if there is an allegation of any ambiguity or interpretational issues with the images, um, the sponsor can say, well, we focus group tested it and everyone in all of these demographics agreed that this image was not, you know, not a, a difficult thing to understand in relation to this text. 
So it's it's also a safeguarding of the quality of, of the contract. So we do all that. Of course, once we've proven it in one industry, a lot of those assumptions can be carried over into others and we don't have to be as comprehensive in the next one unless there are different end users and different cultural groups and different regions involved, which which happened to us in the, in the Oricon employment contract, which was one of the first big projects we worked on, which is now rolled out in seven different countries. And we had some, some very famous visuals. So this contract was, was the big <laughs> the big one hit wonder initially in the comic book contract project. It was written about in the Wall Street Journal and the Financial Review. And it was heralded as the future of employment law and, and you know, very complimentary. And it certainly is low hanging fruit from the perspective of relational contract. The employment contract is a pretty obvious place to start. But some of the visuals in this contract, they did not translate well in other jurisdictions. So when Oricon, who's a, an engineering consulting company, when they rolled it out in, in a different jurisdiction than Australia, using the stork, for instance, as a, as a symbol of maternity in a culture where the stork does not symbolize anything relating to maternity, uh, some of the feedback was, why is the bird abducting my baby? What am I signing here? <laughs> So, um, some of the more humorous aspects. An international company worked with your project. We're very grateful. So the, the employment contract, as it was when we created it, and it's gone through with some iterations of changes since then, but the one that, that we completed initially is available on the comic book contract website, the, the Oricon employment contract. And it's been given a number of awards, including the um, a Golden Quill Award for uh, business communication, which was great. Your first like sponsor, your first thing, like you said, you hit a home run or baseball reference on the first time. That's awesome. Yes, yeah, we knew we were doing something right. Um, that was that was an absolute home run. But like I said, it was, it's low hanging relational contract perspective because that relationship, the employer employee relationship, is exactly that, and it is about getting the spirit right, attracting the right employees, communicating everything in the right way. Um, and it was a fantastic process looking at what needed to go and what could, what needed to stay in terms of, of communicating the, the essentials for that employment relationship. Do you want to share your screen? I think it might be better if people looked at it themselves at home if they want to. I can bring it up on the screen. It sort of looks like this. There's a video about it. And then if you scroll down here, you see the actual employment contract. Um, but it's, it's, it's interactive with embedded videos and little values and, and buttons that sort of train you to be who you want to be um, as a personality, all the communication expectations. And then when it gets quite text heavy here, we have all the behavioral drivers for the ideal employee. And these green buttons are the actual onboarding training that a, an employee needs to do. So by the time the employee has gone through all of this, and it, this is a reference to the, the, the laws on the national employment standards so you don't regurgitate it. And there's that thing from the stork that's abducting the baby. <laughs> <laughs> and then, of course, penguins, because penguins co-parent. So it's not just about maternal care, but it's about parent care. Um, what happens if we part ways and serious misconduct. Again, the, the national employment standards are being referred to. This goes live to the national employment website of the Australian national standards. Why regurgitate it? If it changes, so does your contract anyway. So live link to the to the website where the actual legislation is being kept. Those are the minimum standards of employment. But when it changes, the workday, which is the, the software housing where this sits in Oricon, alerts employees. And we create something which grows with the employee. People are consulting their contracts uh, for, for training and for updates. And it's really interesting to keep an eye on those statistics. So, yeah, well worth it in terms of doing things differently. But it takes about 40 minutes for a new employee to go through the whole process of signing up their contract. But then they've done their onboarding. Yeah. And any HR person will tell you that's a big load off of their mind because it's done. Yay. <laughs> it's done. They look in the interactive process of it, like keeps them engaged as they're working their way through it. So that's great. And this is about seven, you know, six years ago now. And I still get emails from new Oricon employees at every level. We are taking a brief break from this conversation to ask for your financial support. With each episode, we hope you can see how lawyers and peacemakers like you are contributing to the healing of the world. It takes many kinds of resources for the integrative law movement to keep going and affecting change. Your monetary donation 
can help us continue this important work by supporting the activities and the members of this community. Each contribution goes to promote the stability and accessibility of the movement and to support basic expenses like our Mighty Network Group, web hosting, social media and event management, and this Integrative Lawyers of the World podcast. Because we like to give people choices, we have ongoing monthly options to match your budget or you can make a one-time donation. Thanks to our non-profit corporate sponsor, the Renaissance Law Society, US supporters are able to make tax-deductible donations. Supporters from other countries, please check your local tax laws. To help establish confidence in your choice to supporters, we have set up an open collective transparent plan to track how the community money is spent. For ways to support the integrative law movement and our world-changing work, go to our website at www.integrativelaw.com and click on Support the Movement tab at the top of the page. Another great way to support us is to rate us five stars and comment, like, follow or subscribe to us on iTunes, Spotify, Google, YouTube or your favourite podcast platform. These ratings and interactions help us get seen and heard by even more people to make an even stronger impact. Thank you for your support and spending time with us today. Enjoy the rest of this conversation. You had mentioned a couple of things as you were explaining this. One, um, relational um, issues or relation, how contracts are rela- relational in nature and also mentioning pain points. Um, I just want to like expand on that a little bit more about how for, for those who are not necessarily lawyers or don't who quite get like how are contracts relational thinking like you know sometimes not our entire audience are not lawyers no i think the lawyers are actually the ones who will struggle most with this it's a rethinking it's an innovation it's a changing of mindsets it's an integrated way of thinking better i think we're healthier about contracts but they're not necessarily just transactional and they're they shouldn't just be punitive they can have some punitive elements in it where they punish someone for not living up to the promise that they're keeping by signing the contract but that is part of the relationship where it should be and that's why the contract that you just saw has values it has expectations and it it talks about managing the relationship and what happens when we part ways let's talk about this amicably and you know this is where we're going to go really upset if there's serious misconduct and that's what that looks like it's all about defining that relationship and if it's not an employment contract if it's something else then that relationship is going to be completely different. So I think this is quite a a nice segue to also answer your question about pain points. Because in an employment relationship, the pain points are often the expectations that the employer and the employee might have mismanaged in relation to each other. Um, And taking things out that really you'd never uphold it anyway, like the anti-competition clause. Anyone will tell you they're probably not legal most places anyway. And even when they are, it's bad publicity to use them. So get rid of them. They, they put a bad taste in the relationships. Just stop. Um, that's thinking relationally instead of transaction. And being less, less uh, partisan about representing one party as opposed to the other and thinking more collaboratively about coming together in a healthy relationship. I think, well, I know that law is very risk averse. And that's the way that we are trained as lawyers, you know, to identify, pinpoint the risks and be very scared of them and then try to draft something really long and elaborate to minimize or avoid that risk for the party that we're representing. And look, that's fair enough. That's our job. But if we sometimes thought a little bit differently and instead of drafting complex, long, unreadable contracts that nobody's ever going to read for the 0.001% of, excuse my French, crap that can go wrong, (laughs) Instead, focusing on the 99.99% of relationships that we can make better and healthier and stronger and avoid disputes. That is good relational thinking. And there is, it's not just my word. I mean, there is economic science behind this. In 2016, Oliver Hart and Belt Holmstrom were giving a Nobel Prize for proving that relational contracts are healthier, more innovative and save a lot of money because they avoid disputes and they actually lead to better results and better exchanges between parties because they're not partisan. Um, So, yeah, it's not just me, but definitely the visual contracts that we've created 
we didn't realize it at the time because I was very much a transactional lawyer. But once we've created them for a few years, someone just took it for granted that we were part of the relational contract movement. And I'm like, what's that? <laughs> looked at it and, oh my God, we are. Oh, look, we just got a Nobel Prize. How cool. <laughs> <laughs> we're part of that Nobel Prize. That's yeah, great. Exactly. You always want to be part of something that's won a Nobel Prize. So that's cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, that's excellent. Um, but I mean, as a segue, the pain points that you talked about and, and the and the relational management, let me show you a contract that is completely different. So I'll, I'll go back to my website where we have a lot of exemplars. And I just want to show you the Mission Australia one because um, that one is completely different. So can you see that one there? Yes. What is, before you show us the contract, what is Mission Australia? The so Mission Australia is a charity that helps disadvantaged Australians get back on their own feet. And that also includes children from disadvantaged homes or in disadvantaged situations. And the contract that we were asked to work with by the sponsors is a consent form for receiving a support for mental health from Mission Australia, but for children. Now, a children's mental health consent form presents so many pain points that between you and me, lawyers don't understand. So we needed to talk very carefully with the therapists and the psychologists and the psychiatrists that work with these children understand what the, the problem is with the consent form. And some of these problems were, well, the kids don't want to be there. They resent having to be there. Uh, they come from cultures where it's stigmatized to require uh, health support. Sometimes so do their parents and guardians. There are some massive issues here. Another big pain point was that sometimes the parents or guardians that are the ones who have to sign the consent form are actually a huge part of the problem. And the children don't feel empowered they feel like they're just there because they have to be, and this isn't really about them. I mean, imagine being told by a therapist, we're here for you, sweetheart. And then they turn to the problem and say, can you just sign your consent? This is an issue. So this contract actually exists in two different formats. We have a lovely colorized one with, with some nice colorized koala bears and platypuses representing the parties. We have the values here. But this one is in black and white because, drum roll, it comes with a box of crayons. Um, and the children are asked to color it in as everything is being explained to them. It helps them to engage with the content because some of the, the writing and the words will combine. But there's also quite a lot of research in psychology showing that it improves the, the mnemonic technique if you're coloring in. Like think of all the mandalas for grown-ups and all the relaxation that comes with that. So it's a very tense situation. Um, and on that, actually, that was really interesting. We tested this with the uh, Melbourne Children's Parliament uh, as part of the focus group creation. And some of the older children told us that they would actually prefer the coloring in version because it would give them something to do in a relatively unpleasant situation, which is an interesting uh, piece of feedback. Um, and after we started writing about that, grown-ups told me, well, look, I would prefer the coloring in version if it was for grown-ups too, because it would give me something to do as my therapist is explaining this to me. And I'm not very comfortable in that room initially. Huh. Never thought of that, but there you go. So many of these things that can make kids feel better can also make adults feel better. It turns out we're all human, <laughs> even adults. Um, but one of the things I wanted to show you is that this is all the things we need to put together a picture of you. That's why we need all that information. We'll keep it safe. Here are the usual suspects of allergies. And this is who we have to share data with. The very difficult pain point of explaining mandatory reporting. Sometimes you might be lost in a maze and we need to help someone. And then we have to share what you've said. Mandatory reporting will help you out of a, of a sticky spot, um, allowing communication with the school. And then here's my absolutely favorite part. I don't remember where this originated. I think it was with Alternative Contracting, which is my husband's uh, business. Uh, he co-created this with us. I think it was his idea. Why not have the children sign the contract? See, to a lawyer, that's preposterous. <laughs> Why would you do that? That's not even binding. It has no purpose. But the moment that came out into the ether and in the co-creation process, um, the sponsor loved it because they were like, oh, my God, yes, it might not carry any weight at all in terms of, of legal signature, but it makes the child feel empowered. And sometimes a signature isn't about being legal binding. It's about feeling the power and ownership of the document. And if you look at the way it's phrased, the children are signing that the parent and guardian has done their best to explain this. So it actually puts the parent and guardian as their servant or as the one who's having to do something for them, again, reinforcing that this is for you, this is to help you. And then the parent and guardian have to sign not only their permission, uh, but that they have done their best to explain it to the child in their care. It's part of their due diligence as parents and guardians 
to explain things to children. So really putting the child front and center. I love this contract. We're, we're just kicking off the impact testing. It's been out and applied now for about six months. So we're starting to collect data on it. It's a long psychometric data collection, so it'll take about two and a half years before we get all the feedback so we can write it up more comprehensively. But what we're getting so far is, is very, very positive. Um, and there seem to be more of the black and white versions flying off the shelves with the crayons than the colorized ones, which is really interesting. And, and I can't wait to, to write more about that with some of the psychologists who helped us create it. Well, I think it's a wonderful project and the contract, like you said, how it empowers the child and lets the child know you are valued, you know? Um, We're here to help you. We are here to help you. The reason why I showcase it with the bank one is, is pain points are so radically different, right? So between the, the employment contract and the bank uh, cosmic contract and, and the kids black and white coloring in consent form, these are so radically different, not just in the way that they look, but in the pain points that they're trying to solve, the relationship that they're trying to manage, the expectations that they're trying to communicate, and in this case, the empowerment of the child that they're hoping to try and facilitate because that's a real problem in the therapist and child relationship because of that consent form that seems to do the opposite. So it's about the lawyer thinking the role of a document. This document isn't just, you know, to cover the therapist's bottom, <laughs> as we still so colorfully say, um, but also it can have another function. It can be so much more than just a legal document. I have explained that to like some of my uh, clients or even just friends when we're talking about contracts, you know, a lot of times people view contracts as things that you can enforce, you know, to enforce your rights. Yes. But I think it's something that you can create and understand. I guess, I guess I've been a relational, you know, lawyer too. You, it's a you have. Don't look now, Carrie, but you're a relational contract lawyer. <laughs> to, to create an understanding, right? Make sure we're on the same page. We're in this together. And if you have that understanding, hopefully it's going to minimize the chance you're going to have to go into the court system. Yeah. But I mean, the good thing about being a lawyer today is that we have so many different labels for the rethinking of law. We've got conscious law, integrative law, collaborative law, partnering, so many different ways of rethinking, collaborating instead of being partisan in legal relationships. And look, not everyone's going to love this, but for the relationships that we are allowed to come in and help with visuals, and, and there's a plethora of these contracts out there now, um, it's awesome. If, if you haven't already seen them, there are also contracts created by Robert DeRoy in South Africa. He creates visual comic book contracts specifically for people who have uh, literacy issues. So we don't have as big a problem with that in Australia, thankfully. So we have the luxury of being able to put in language and words. We try to keep it as simple and as conversational as we can for ease of comprehension and, and breadth of engagement. Um, but Robert has a whole different demographic issue, and that's fruit pickers and domestic workers who literally cannot read. So he has to look at, at things very differently. And it, it's wonderful to work with Robert. We've, we've written a couple of articles together. Um, and he's very focused on social justice and access to justice, as are some of our contracts. As you're talking, I have like three things I want to say at once. Um, let me try to get it in an order and then you can. This happens. These interviews, I won't get derailed. <laughs> Before we started recording, we were talking about how are lawyers or the legal profession responding to the visual contracts. And I'm putting it in my shoes. Like I, um, I think they're phenomenal. I think they're great. I'm a little scared that I don't have the skill set to do it. I'm good at putting, explaining things in words, giving examples, but how do I learn if I wanted to start developing or give a visual contract to my client? What are some suggestions that you to, to give? How do I go about doing this? Well, you can talk to your client about whether you think it's appropriate, whether they would like this kind of a contract, whether they want something visual and engaging and fun and poppy. Um, it's not all clients aren't going to love it. Um, and if they do, then there are a number of artists that we can recommend and, and there are, we can certainly help consult with stuff. And so can my husband. There are also a number of law firms who are beginning to dabble in this. You don't have to have an artist. I mean, more or less, the quality of the art determines the price of the contract. Um, I, you can have a look at my husband's website. He charges about $1,500 for a simple storyboard with ideas. And then he charges for the images, depending on what kind of artist you want. 
But you could do something with simple Canva art if you have a commercial license with Canva to use that commercially. Or you could do something like Pixton Comics that helps you design your own comics. That's not a very expensive service either. It won't be visually wonderful, but I promise you it'll it'll be better than without it if that's something that the client are active to pursue. We know from the data that, that this is not just, and, and we have 20 markets, we have 20 different silos of research in this area. One of them is circuits of culture, looking at the changes of law and media communications. One is the philosophy of the consent form. And when, when you tell a philosopher that if you don't read a contract, but you sign it, that's consent, they will say, no, that is not consent. I'm like, well, it is to the lawyer and, and the philosopher will tell you that is wrong. True consent requires insight and understanding. Yeah. <laughs> Which was the basis of the UK case that you were talking about earlier, right? Yeah. So, yeah. So all of these different silos and one of these silos, and this is the one that sort of I feel a bit funny about, is called transparent law as a marketing tool. Because there's now a lot of research coming out of some, some of the products that we've created that is showing that these visual contracts are fantastic marketing tools because the public are mad for this. As lawyers or the lawyer department, you can help communicate that with your clients to see, hey, you can use these, but now you can use it not just for this contract, but extend value. Because why I'm thinking that's so important is because you're always, especially if you're on um, working with smaller businesses, right? <clears throat> they want you to do a contract for a lawyer as get it to me as quickly as possible, as cheap as possible. I found that I can get a template for a contract on some website for $50. So I want you to do this contract for $50. So this contract that you're looking at now is for Dave the Handyman. And it's one of my favorite older contracts. It's the only contract we've ever worked on. Well, actually we've had a couple now, but it was the first contract we worked on that didn't have an underlying contract or set of contracts that we were translating into a visual format. It was done from scratch, which is fantastic. So. We've got Dave the Handyman, bespoke artwork from a, a local artist, Joel Young, um, explaining his basic values, that he works hard, his three main pain points, tell me about the job and no surprises, ensure the space is safe, and pay me on time. Those are his three main pain points. So that expectation, they're crystal clear. Then you've got his warranty promise and his, his dinosaur bones in the garden. Very deliberately pick something that's unlikely to happen so you wouldn't be bogged down by the exemplar. Um, so if there's any surprises, let me know. We might have to negotiate the quote, but let's get started. And then the, the details that you need. And then on the back of this, he'll print the quote for the job. Um, he found, and, and this is sort of what started the whole marketing project, he found not only that the pain points were greatly reduced when he told us how it was being received. This is one of my husband's contracts, so it was purely commercial. It was done for, I think, less than $1,000, uh, Australian dollars. So that's what, about 700 US? Anyway, it was very inexpensive, even with the bespoke artwork. Um, but he, Dave found that the, his clients, and he calls them the old biddies because he has a lot of older women who are single who he works for, they kept it on the fridge because they thought it was so cute. And then everyone would see it and go, oh, my God, is that your handyman? Oh, that's so cute. I love that he's gone to the airport explaining this so clearly. I want to call him, too. Um, so it was a really strong marketing uh, tool for him, which is so interesting. And then Bank West happened a few years later, and that's what really kicked off the research in the Transparent Law as a Marketing Tool. Their uh, less BS campaign, as they told, they called it, less bank stuff, less BS, you know, haha. <laughs> That campaign based on transparent product schedules was not only one of the cheapest in the history of the bank, but one of the most successful in recruiting new clients. I'm smiling because it's going back to how I think one of the ways that we were talking at the very beginning in your introduction, how innovating the legal practice and how we are changing or how the legal practice is changing and our roles in it may be changing. And do you know what the secret is, Carrie? Don't tell anyone, but lawyers aren't always the best at everything. So if we just learn a little bit about what they're doing in marketing and psychology and philosophy, maybe we could actually learn something and innovate our relatively stale profession. <gasps> you know, when you were talking about the law school, like uh, teaching lawyers and law students communicating for the end user, communicating with the end user, I just said, I just saw as you were talking, I saw this, you know how you have in law schools, you have moot court for um, trials, you have, uh, you know, at the appellate advocacy stuff, wouldn't it be neat if there was some type of 
make it fun, but a competition. Okay, group of students, here's some complicated legal jargon. Who can come up with the best, put this in plain English? Who can do it the best, you know? Or, But even better, I want this group to create a good solution for uh, contractors who work in masonry. I want this group to create a simple explanation that works for florists. I want this group to, to create a for florists in India. I want this group to create, a, so where are you? Who are your end users? What is your product? It will change. And so we actually do that at UWA. We run a, a business line practice and one of the portfolios is um, alternative contracting as we call it. So coming up with a, a, a freaky, weird idea for contracts for different professions that the kids are role playing, that they're managing a business. And I think so that would be a class. great yeah. class. Oh my gosh, I'll take it. <laughs> that sounds oh, cool. fascinating. Come on, Carrie, you're a bit overqualified, but you can help me teach it. <laughs> that is a great class. Oh my gosh. I hope more law schools are doing that. I mean, we have a number of really huge innovations across the legal profession at the moment. Like I said, it's an exciting time to be a lawyer, right? In, in New Zealand, they have put it in a plain language act. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but everything in New Zealand, everything, that comes out of government or a public office has to be in plain language. Legalese is now outlawed. Wow, thumbs up. Were they ready for this when they put the law in? No, they were not, but they're getting there. <laughs> I think non-lawyers are like, of course, plain, what's the big deal about that? That should be there all the case. But as lawyers, we know well, sometimes when there's legalese because this few words in legalese can explain something you know and so to put that in plain language sometimes requires more words or explanation absolutely i mean just like a few words to the medical professional will mean a ton of stuff but he might have to take 10 minutes to explain it to you same with a lawyer sometimes those few words are amazing and i love the way that our profession has developed this complex and rich language for professional use but it is just that it's for professional use when you create something that is not just for you, like a contract, you really have to make the effort of explaining what it means. One of my favorite examples is due diligence. A non-lawyer does not know what that means, but it means something very specific to different kinds of transactional lawyers. And, and there's a, a very specific standard of care that goes into what is due diligence in different contexts, depending on the profession. But why can't you just explain that? Why can't you explain exactly what the, that level of care is and stop almost hiding behind these words that, that have so little ability to manage anyone's expectations unless they're a lawyer and a good one at that. When you're focusing on relational contracts and you're working with a client, why don't we put energy in this is what you let's put energy in the 99.9% .9 of relationships and how we can fill those. Yeah, there is that 0.1%, but now it seems like the contracts are geared toward that 0.1% at the sacrifice of the 99. Flip that. Why? That 0.1% is probably going to be a loss clause anyway. Because if people don't want to understand you and they don't come into it with, with mutual expectations that they wish to have, that relationship is doomed from the beginning. These, these people should never get married. And so no matter how much time you spend on a prenup, it's going to go wrong. But if you focus on the relationships where there is a genuine interest in collaboration, which is luckily, even in commercial transactions, most of them, because there is a mutual interest in pursuing mutual profit, then we can think outside the box. We can make them richer. We can make them deeper. And we can find solutions that actually makes the relationship more rewarding for both parties by allowing them to feel more embraced by a mutual contract than being represented. Um, one, of, one of my favorite illustrators, Louis Silvestro, some years ago, drew a fantastic image of nice people hiding behind ugly masks. I'll see if I can find it to, and, and I'll email it to you um, because it's, it, it, it almost hurt to see how an illustrator was perceiving the live discussion of, of healthy relationships being ruined by partisan legal presentation. That happens, doesn't it? Yeah. Wow. We did a series five was on collaborative law. And a lot of that is about in, in the family setting of trying to preserve the relationship. So quick questions now, rapid fire questions. Well, I don't know if they're rapid fire questions. One, is there any set of um, standard contract clauses that have been converted into, or not converted into, that have had corresponding like comic contract to it 
that someone can go somewhere and buy. I understand what you mean, and I'm very hesitant to answer you, not because I don't want to, but because it's a difficult question to answer. There is a, a library of, of visuals, and they're mostly just icons that Stefania Pacera has helped WCC create, so the World Commercial Contracting Organization that used to be IACCM. They're, they're for contract managers, and there is a library there of some relatively simple iconography. And as long as we don't move it past that, then I'm happy with it. But there's there's two things that I want to say. First of all, you have to you have to still ensure that your imagery is is bespoke for the purpose. Because remember that stork, right? <laughs> there's a powerful lesson in there about understanding that the image has to work for who your end user is, not just for you. We run a very real risk if we start to standardize these illustrations of not doing what we want to do and help law be more accessible. If we create an extra dimension of visuals that only lawyers really understand, then we're not helping. So if we teach a class in law school about what these icons mean, I mean, there's a, there's a famous example that the Canadian case, oh my God, loved it so much, where the thumbs up emoji was a, a binding signature. Love it. Absolutely love it. It's Saskatchewan judge ruled that a thumbs up em emoji in an exchange of text where the last question was, so are we going ahead? Thumbs up. That's a yes. Of course, it's a yes. People around the world have, on social media expressed surprise and shock that that's a legally binding yes. Why? In every communication that you would have with a human being, that is so clearly a yes. So maybe there are very simple communications like that where we have a universal understanding of what it means. But I'm collaborating with Matthias Pendel, who is at the Max Planck Institute in Hamburg, and he's specializing in emojis in law. Um, and he can write chapters about how in law, emojis mean different things in different places and to different demographics. His favorite example being the, the laughing emoji with the crying eyes, where it, it means, haha, that's really funny, but it also means, oh my God, that's really awful, depending on the age of the user under the same roof. <laughs> So, so careful with these standard imagery. I don't think law is anywhere near being able to develop standard imagery for contracts. Although having said that, maybe I'm being a bit too careful. And maybe there are some standard images that we can rely on, but I would exercise great care in assuming that because regional differences, cultural differences, even something as simple as color. Like I, I've used pink uh, because it was part of a, a sponsor's three colors in the marketing outlines. I've used pink in a couple of contracts and the focus groups have hammered me. I even got called a misogynist pig for using pink on an avatar representation of a, of a domestic care worker. I like the idea of collaborating with the team to, with the team, whether it be like an art, your artist, your client and coming together and working on this, it, it sounds it sounds something that is enjoyable. I'm just thinking, how do you make it economically feasible for the client in terms of, um, for the larger clients, for the larger contracts where they can spend that, but I'm thinking of the smaller. I mean, I do have a quick answer. I, my research assistants span lots of different disciplines from medical research to psychological research, financial research, I have one in pretty much every discipline because I need them for the industries that we're creating contracts for. But a small company doesn't need a research assistant. They have their own end users and their own industry insight. And they have pretty good instincts about what communicates well with their end users. So if they co-create a contract with their lawyer, they should be able to do something based on their own knowledge and their own access to their own end users that works. It doesn't have to cost an arm and a leg. For the different, for those who want to find out more information on the uh, comic book contract project, we will list the website in our show notes, um, and also your husband's website. I want to make sure we include that too. Is that alternative contracting? Alternative contracting biz. Alternative contracting biz, and then as on the more broader topic of lawyers as designers. You had mentioned a website too. Is it lawyersasdesigners.com? Yes, it is. The lawyersasdesigners.com is a new initiative. We haven't had our big, we've only had a soft release. Uh, so please no one hurry over there. It's, it's still under construction. But what we're doing is we're collecting alternative solutions to legal challenges. 
So we're not just talking about visual design, we're talking about architectural design, uh, legal tech design, using common sense and smarts to rethink the way that lawyers can offer solutions that are just better. So lawyers designing better outcomes, better solutions, better platforms, and even like architecture, there are there are lawyers contributing to the architecture of courtrooms that are proving to have better outcomes because the judges are at the same levels and there's more collaborative conversations. That is part of the whole big project of lawyers helping to design better functions, humanizing law, if you will. Yeah, that is wonderful. Um, and, and visual contracts are a small part of that. But if you head over to lawyersdesigners.com, this is where we're collecting um, through Airtable submissions of, of innovative designs. They have to be real worldy. Um, and so they have to be not just an idea, but something that's actually being used. And we are then collecting the editorial board. It's pretty, um, pretty awesome. It's Emily Albon from uh, from London, myself, uh, J. Kim Wright, the mother of uh, <laughs> conscious contracting and, and everything that is great and innovative, um, and then Lisa Tui, a professor from Newcastle who has pioneered legal design from the east coast of Australia with Inklings and Sarah Raymond. So fantastic team, and we are looking after all of the solutions that we're getting, and, and we're getting some amazing stuff like. Something simple like a, a tablet with all the jury documents on it that makes it easy and quick to search and save so many trees. What does integrative law or being an integrative lawyer mean to you? Thinking outside the box, embracing that we can learn a lot from other disciplines, uh, embracing the relationship, embracing the client as somebody who's qualified to give some co-creative input into what we make because they know what they need if we just listen to them sometimes. Um, and, and just. I think accepting that lawyers don't always know everything. I know it's a painful truth, but it's there. <laughs> and integrating the other disciplines, inviting them in and sharing them with us. Well, thank you so much for being part of Integrative Lawyers of the World. I really enjoyed our conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much, George.